Hey, Tommy, guess what? I just got back uh, from driving the all-new Toyota Land Cruiser. Yeah, and I can't wait to talk about it on today's podcast because this is one of the most exciting vehicles of the year. Yeah, and we can talk about it and kind of my driving impressions. And then uh, there's a little bit of controversy that got stirred up on the program. I'll bring uh, that up as well. And then we can also talk about how it compares to the Forerunner, which we did a very special podcast on last week. Uh, and then we can also mention the GX because it's hard now to pick an off-road worthy Toyota because there's so many. Yeah, for sure. And um, we're going to talk about um, what you thought of how it drove off-road, some of the cool features of this vehicle, and whether or not it is worth the money. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the money. You want to configure one? Yeah, for sure. So the new Land Cruiser is a lot more affordable than the old one, but it's also a lot smaller and has some different options. So it starts at 55,950 for the Land Cruiser 1958. With round headlights. Yep. And that's before any options. And I think that's also before destination. So realistically, you're going to be like in the mid to high 50s. Then the Land Cruiser, the Land Cruiser Edition is 61,950. So nice, they named it twice. Except I was talking to the marketing <laughs> gal behind it. Yeah. And she said they're just gonna call it the Toyota Land Cruiser. So it's not the Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser? No, it's not like the Ferrari La Ferrari. But see, in the configurator, it says Land Cruiser. Right. And it says build your 2024 Land Cruiser, and then the model is Land Cruiser. It is a little confusing. Yes. I do agree. And then the, the one that are coming out first is the Land Cruiser First Edition, 74,950. So that's a lot of money. It's got all of the goodies. It's got, you know, the off-road stuff and the little roof rack on it. So that's the one that's going to be hitting dealers first. But, you know, mid-70s for a Land Cruiser, that's some big money. Yeah. I mean, well, for the new Land Cruiser. For the new Land Cruiser. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the old Land Cruiser uh, for a second because we actually owned uh, 200 series. We mm -hmm. actually own an 80 series right now. Uh, so we are, you know, pretty deep into the Land Cruiser world. Um, and I think... You know, what's changed between the 200 series and the newest 2024 version is they've kind of gone back to their roots. And I don't want to get confused with all like the Prados and the different, you know, 250 versions in Europe. Let's just talk about the Americans because I think uh, American versions, because I think that's what, uh, you know, we know the best. So I don't want to necessarily talk about stuff that we haven't driven. Okay. So, you know, the, the, let's face it, the Land Cruiser uh, 200 series, which you're, which you're showing right now, is that ours? No, that's the Heritage Edition. Mm -hmm. um, just got a little kind of uh, too bougie, right? The, the problem I think the Toyota saw with it was that it was actually encroaching into Lexus territory. And if not not just encroaching, but actually surpassing Lexus territory, right? That Heritage Edition was well over $100,000. They were a little bit less expensive than that. They were like 90s. So, so they were, you know, still under six figures, but... Look, in, in the real world, they were 100, dude. Yeah, that's true, after markups. Yeah. I think the 200 Series was a really cool vehicle. And there's a big following around 200 Series. And, you know, they didn't sell very very many because it's, it's, it is hard to justify, like you said, spending 80, 90, 100 grand for a Toyota in the U.S. We're very brand conscious. Yeah. But a Land Cruiser person always went out and bought a Land Cruiser. And Toyota knew that there was... Granted, a relatively small subset of people that had to have that Land Cruiser because the Land Cruiser stands for not only off-road capability, but durability. It was a Toyota engineered to last, they would never say this, but unofficially 250,000 miles where standard Toyotas typically last 150,000 miles, or at least that's what they're engineered to before major failure. Hey, podcast listeners and TFL Talk viewers. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about a quick and simple way to sell your car or truck with the help of our new partner, High Road. With High Road's online portal, you enter your vehicle's VIN number or plate, mileage, and zip code, and you'll get competing offers from several qualified dealers in your area within seconds. You pick the best deal offered and follow through with the dealer to sell your car. No more managing scammy emails from buyers on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. No more time wasted on no-show buyers. No bait and switch with a will you take a check excuse from sketchy buyers. Now keep in mind, these offers will be for trade-in values of your vehicle. If you want to go through the hassle of getting more for your car, that's up to you. But if you want to sell your car hassle free and fast, Go to tflcar.com and click sell your car in the navigation menu. Or click on the high road ad at the bottom of the website if you're on mobile. Or click on the column if you're on a desktop. High road makes it easy and we like easy. Yeah, and the, 
cool thing about the Land Cruiser, at least the last one, was that it had this great reputation of being very um, reliable, very comfortable, uh, very well built uh, for people in the know, right? So if you were a Kardashian, you'd get the G-Wagon, which had all, which has all this baggage that's associated with it. Yeah. But, you know, if you lived someplace that was very wealthy and you wanted to kind of not be showy and not kind of scream, I've got a ton of money, you would get the Land Cruiser because people in the know understood that it was comfortable, it was luxurious, but it didn't scream, you know, what the G-Wagon screams, which is, you know, I've got way too much money. And they would last, you know, your whole entire life, right? They sure. would go without difficulty. It had kind of an every person vibe to it. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, that that... Here's the thing, right? Starting in the 1990s is really when Land Cruiser shifted from a very utilitarian vehicle to a more luxury-oriented vehicle. Right with the 80 series, we started seeing leather and um, intermittent wipers and luxuries like that. Right, and then in the 100 series, it got power so, antenna. Yeah, right. In the 100 series, it got you know the heated seats and the navigation system, and they got more luxurious. And, and the then, cool box. And the cooled box. And 200 <laughs> series went even wilder on top of that. And then, with the new Land Cruiser, they decided to tone it down a little. Now, this is where, Deb, we are going to have to go into that territory that you don't want to go into a little bit. Because alongside the big Land Cruiser, there's always been a slightly smaller one ab abroad. Yes. Called the Prado. Right. Which was sold here as the GX. Right. Right. Lexus. Yeah. And now, for the first time, when they killed the 200 Series in 2021, um, they said it's not coming back. It did come back, but it didn't come back as the 300 Series. It came back as the little mini version. Yeah. So what, what they did was they kind of changed it from being a G wagon, or better yet, a Range Rover competitor, with the 200 series, to now being more of a Wrangler slash Forerunner slash uh, let's say Bronco competitor with the latest version of it. And I, I say that with a big asterisk because obviously the Bronco and the Wrangler are convertibles, whereas the Land Cruiser is not. But it made it much more um, back to basics, back to its original roots, where uh, you can make it uh, something that you could like daily drive every day and not have to go to the bank and get a loan that will mortgage your house. Right. And I'm saying that very well aware that 55000 is still a lot of money for a car. It is a lot of money. But coming from 90000 it makes it feel affordable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it was a good decision because, like we said, the 200 Series did sell to the Land Cruiser people. But because it was so expensive, I think that they really did price themselves out of a lot of people that were considering, you know, a fully loaded Bronco or a Wrangler or even a Grand Cherokee. This is more of a Grand Cherokee competitor in some ways. But um, now, at the $50,000, $60,000 mark, it's going to be targeted to a much larger audience. So I think it was a really smart decision. And if you do want a 300 series Land Cruiser, you can still buy one in the States. It's just called the Lexus LX. Yeah. 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 If you want to be bougie. Yeah. If you want to be bougie. Exactly right. <laughs> so uh, so I think most people were happy with that decision. You know, we've done a boatload of videos on everything Land Cruiser. Uh, and so I was, Tommy, super excited when I saw that they both had the 1958 edition and the Land Cruiser Land Cruiser model to drive and to compare. And so Andre and I uh, got behind the wheel of both of them uh, and uh, took them on this course that Toyota built, uh, which, you know, was uh, – uh, I was listening to a bunch of podcasts. I was listening to some people, and they were all like, what a great course they built. Uh, but, you know, I'm always very skeptical. Uh, and so they will never build a course that the vehicle can't do. Mm -hmm. So usually what the courses are designed to do – is show off the capability of the vehicle without actually testing the capability of the vehicle. And this was very much the case with the Land Cruiser. Uh, you know, I was listening, like I say, some podcasts, some videos, and people were talking about, oh, you got 30 degrees sideways. I'm like, that's not really a test of a vehicle, <laughs> right? There, there are those, once upon a time, uh, Range Rover Land Rover had these, uh, like, um, slopes that they built out in front of their dealerships that did the same thing. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you, you can be very um, scared at 30 degrees, but it, it's it's the center of gravity of the vehicle. Most vehicles will do that, um, let alone tall off-roaders. So you could do that with a Camry, for instance. Uh, so I, I got to say, I, I was disappointed in what Toyota had built. Uh, they had like two rock gardens. They had kind of this small river crossing, and then they had some like, you know, a little some hills and some descents. And to be fair, Tommy, I've gone in the last 14 years on a lot of programs and for off-roaders, and, and they, they, they br break down into basically two categories. Um, when we were going on Subaru, it was like the Subarus of the world, the Toyotas of the world, 
uh, and think of any other potential off-roaders where either they build a course or they take you someplace that's relatively mild, that doesn't really test a vehicle, and they don't want to put the journalist or uh, the vehicles uh, in danger. And then there are two exceptions to that rule, uh, and that is um, Jeep and Land Rover. Jeep and Land Rover, when you go on a program that's off-road, you will do some serious off-roading. Like, best example of that is when we ran the Rubicon Trail, which is, you know, this is a 13-mile trail that takes two days to do. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, tough and, route, and, and for with, sure. with Jeep, we ran that in a Wrangler, and we ran that in a Gladiator. Uh, and I remember doing very similar things uh, with Range Rovers and with Land Rovers, um, where you're out in the wild and you're out there really trying to test the vehicle to its utmost, and the manufacturer doesn't seem to be afraid of putting it in danger. Now, Toyota has had a couple trips, though, where they did do some pretty cool off-roading. I did one trip where we drove from Moab to Telluride, and we actually did Hell's Revenge in Moab in a series of TRD Pro models, so that was some good off-roading. But you're right, for the most part, especially for a new vehicle launch, they are pretty timid with what they put their vehicles through. You know, it's their program. They can kind of choose to do that. So, And I was kind of expecting, you know, to be crossing the Serengeti. It's a Land Cruiser route. Yeah, you know, it's you're like, just it's, on a little rock pile. Yeah, it's like Toyota's most, land, it's Toyota's most uh, iconic nameplate, you know. So we should have been in Moab with the beautiful arches behind us or someplace, you know, where the Land Cruiser name actually has, you know, some kind of a reputation instead of this kind of man-made course. So anyway... Uh, that's enough of my whining and whinging, uh, but we, we, you know, we, we we took it on the course, uh, and immediately what I felt is that the car is sprung more um, or set up more for on-road use than off-road use. And ironically, we really didn't have a chance to drive it on road, so it felt like it was an on-road car that you can take off-road versus, let's say, a Wrangler, which is an off-road car that you can take on-road. In other words, a Wrangler feels much better off-road than it does. I mean, than it does on road, and this felt good off road. But uh, you know, like we went on this little rock garden, and then Andre kind of hit it a little bit too hard, and we bashed a rock with the uh, skid plate, uh, um, and, and that was because the suspension was just not um, you know taunt enough to actually give us enough uh, road and uh, ground clearance to actually not hit that rock. So, so I, I as much as I love the ride uh, off road. Um, I kind of feel like there's a lot of room for aftermarket parts, wheels, tires to actually make this, you know, the Land Cruiser that many people think it should be. Well, I mean, the ground clearance is also not super huge on this vehicle. I think it's something like 8.6 inches is what Toyota claims. And, you know, the first one out the door is going to go right to a <laughs> Toyota shop and we're going to see lifts on these immediately. And you, and so you, that's going to be addressed pretty quickly. And you got to figure there might be, if I were Toyota, I'd actually be thinking of this, a TRD Pro version coming, which will give you whatever, you know, you're going to stick with their uh, current uh, lineup, Fox Shocks, and maybe even a Trail Hunter version, which will have Old Man Emu. You could be right, but there wasn't a TRD Pro version of the last Land Cruiser. No, there, we had to build one, remember? Yeah, we, we tried to build one. Yeah. So, I, like, I, I was I was not I was not unhappy with it off road. I mean, it has all the off road cred. So there is a lockable rear diff. Uh, there is a disconnectable sway bar, which is awesome. Uh, there is certainly plenty of ground clearance. If you had the right version, the tires were you know certainly off roady and grippy enough uh, for that course. Uh, but definitely much more of an overlanding rig um, than uh, you know a rock crawler rig. The way that at least the, the two that we drove were set up. Well, and I think that's always been kind of the Land Cruiser ethos. It's it's apart from maybe some cool folks that are doing some crazy stuff with the 40 series, the little Jeepy ones from the 70s. It is a long distance tourer. It's designed to tackle continents, right, and not so much the Rubicon Trail. So it kind of makes sense that maybe it's it's not intended to be a rock crawler. However, they did, like you mentioned, they did some really cool stuff on this vehicle, like the locking rear diff, like the locking center diff, like the sway bar disconnect, that do allow you to do some of those cool, maybe crawling sections, even if it's not fully intended for that. And I got to say, I love the, like the design language of it. You know, I would get... Uh, the base model, the 1958, all day long, especially if you could, you know, maybe uh, get the cloth interior, which I think is a great off-road. And I would rock that thing as a daily driver that I would occasionally take off-road. Uh, and I would be very happy, Tommy. Plenty of power uh, out of the powertrain. And, you know, we know that powertrain because it's the same powertrain uh, that's basically 
uh, in our Tacoma. A little different though. With a hybrid. Standard hybrid, hybrid yeah. yeah. Look, I um, I don't know if you feel this way. I did spend a little bit of time in the 1958 at the launch. Yeah. I didn't drive it, but I did get to poke around it. It's not a very premium feeling interior. No, it's very basic. It's very like Corolla -ish in, in a lot of ways. And I actually love that because that's what I want in my off-roader. I agree. I love that too. But for $57,000 after destination, I'm, I, I would want... I would want some more more quality materials in there. I mean, yeah. it's a it's kind of a big ask for that interior. Yeah, so I'll give you the pluses and the minuses. The pluses are visibility, straight upright windshield. It's awesome. Uh, very comfortable seats, lots of room behind the second row. As far as I know, there won't be a third row. Uh, if you want that, you're nope. going to have to go with the forerunner. Yep, no third row. Um, you know, the materials feel very uh, high uh, usability rated, you know what I'm, you know, I'm not saying high quality, but they just feel like you could like, you know, if you get dirt or if your dog gets its muddy paws on it, you could just wipe them off and you won't feel bad about it. Yes, there's a lot of hard plastics, especially in the 1958 edition. Um, and you still get kind of very small, I think they're 31s from the factory, if, mm -hmm. I, if I don't, which, you know, which is, which is absurdly small. It, it, it just, it's just screaming out for, uh, you know, 33s at least, if not bigger. Uh, but in general, when you get behind the wheel, and you drive it down a road, it just feels right. You know how some cars just immediately feel right? Like everything comes to hand, everything makes sense. It just feels like this car was designed like a tailored suit around you. That's how I feel about the Land Cruiser. So yeah, I would rock that thing as a daily driver always. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, at some point I may want nicer materials, uh, especially at the starting point. Uh, but the, the problem then becomes that even Broncos and Jeeps and Defenders, you know, are now at the sixty thousand dollar range, right? A Rubicon is going to be at least sixty k. Sure. And, and as far as I know, last time I drove by the D Jeep dealership, the only one you can get is a four by e, and I don't know how much they'll start out at, but I'm sure they're certainly around fifty five thousand. I bet you it's not much off. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. And look, there's a couple of cool things that Land Cruiser offers. Like it's a full-time four-wheel drive, the center differential, so you don't have to go between two high and four high. I think that's a really great feature. And yes, you know, Bronco and Jeep can be had with the four auto system, but it functions a little differently in that it's um, not actually center differential. I don't believe, I think it, you know, because there's a two high version as well in those vehicles. So it's more of an electronics-based system, which is fine, but having that third differential is a very expensive and heavy way to engineer a car, but it's also typically very, very durable which is great. I really do like the design, like you said. I think that's fantastic. I like that the towing capacity, that's another thing we should talk about, 6,000 pound towing capacity. Bronco and Wrangler can barely do five. Yeah, it's got a ton of torque with that hybrid. Yeah, so I can't wait to really get it on the Ike and see how it tows. So I think there's really a lot of potential there for capability. And look, you can't pull the doors off compared to like a Bronco or Wrangler. You can't pull the roof off. And I think that is going to be a detractor for a lot of people. But then you get those six letters on the front, which a lot of folks are very confident in is going to be a long lasting, durable, reliable vehicle. So that's going to sell a lot of these Land Cruisers as well. There is a little um, fly my ointment when it comes to uh, the Land Cruiser. And that is at the same program, I was able uh, to uh, drive uh, and I can't talk about that yet because those impressions are still embargoed. The uh, um, Toyota Tacoma LR, um, LR3, yeah. Toyota Tacoma uh, TRD Pro, uh, and of course uh, the Trail Hunter, and also see the Forerunner. Uh, and there's a new version of the Forerunner uh, for 2025. And just let's just talk about when these vehicles will be available. So uh, the Lexus GX, which kind of lives above the Land Cru Cruiser, we can talk about that. We've we've driven it, um, is in dealerships now. The Land Cruiser is hitting dealerships as we speak. Uh, and a hint to the wise, I was talking to the Toyota people and they're built in Japan. And so they deliver the cars to the West Coast and then they kind of propagate. So if you want one early, go to LA, uh, you know, go to someplace in California and you'll have an early crack at it. And then the new Foreigner won't come out realistically toward the end of this year. I'm thinking probably more of the beginning of next year. But the one that, 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 that at least if you're being price conscious, and I think even like uh, off-road conscious would be the one I would get would be the Forerunner um, Trail Hunter, which, you know, we don't know the pricing on That's yet. It's not going to be price conscious at all. Well, I'm saying compared to the Land Cruiser. I don't think even compared to the Land so Cruiser. The current, so the current Forerunner starts at about $42,000. Yeah. So, you know, I figure an SR5 is going to be what? When it comes out, 45, 50, 
40, I mean, 50, yeah, 45, maybe 50,000. An SR5 is going to be, yeah, mid 40s. Okay, but let's say, let's say that the trail hunter is 60, which it could be. Or 65, I think it's probably more in line. Right. Yeah. 65, but you, you can, it's still less than, um, you know, the, the first edition Land Cruiser and about the same as the Land Cruiser Land Cruiser. Sure. And if I were to line those two up uh, in terms of what you get uh, for off road worthiness, uh, so with the Forerunner Trail Hunter, you do get the old man emu shocks. Yep. You do get the bigger 33s from sure. the factory. Uh-huh. Uh, you get a snorkel. Right. Right. You get, uh, you know, a windshield that, that that comes in and out, up and down in the back. Rear window. Rear window. Um, you also get, um, you know, a pretty aggressive Forerunner compared to the current generation. So you're saying that that's a better deal. I, I Yeah, I think, you know... It's probably a better deal because it's going to be. You also get the same powertrain, so there's no difference. You get the four cylinder turbo that's hybridized. So I think that's, remember, it's like 325, 26 horsepower and 400 and something pound foot of torque. Uh, I don't think it tows as much, but you know, it's within a thousand dollars. So the question then in my mind is thousand pounds. Thousand pounds, yeah, sorry. Is would I go for the Forerunner Trail Hunter, which I really fell in love with, or would I get the Land Cruiser Land Cruiser? And from a value perspective, I'd probably get the Forerunner because it's already built out. Yeah, right. Um, I, I mean, in the past, the argument would be, well, the Land Cruiser is going to be a, a higher quality vehicle that's going to last yeah. potentially longer, yeah. right? Even though that was never official, and I can ask Toyota, you know. Why, why is that Land Cruiser sitting in a pile of... Uh, it's on a rock. It looks like a cow poo. No, no, it's on a rock. <laughs> it's like a cow patty. <laughs> Whoever designed that for Toyota, you need to work on that a little better. Yeah, so I, I mean, I could, I'm, I, I'd like to talk to the Toyota guys and see, like, you know, is this built to the same standard as a 200 series? And I know their default answer is going to be, you know, we engineer all our cars to meet our rigorous internal testing. That's what they're going to say. Sure. So I, I'm not sure that this vehicle is going to last longer. I mean, I think when you're at that top level forerunner versus a land cruiser they both have the same wheelbase they're roughly the same size they have the same powertrain like you talked about it's going to come down to preference and a design standpoint and i think that's going to really sell a lot of vehicles right and the label right and the pe- name people, yeah people want the land cruiser right a lot of people like that more traditional and actually now that i think about it, it i wasn't so sure in the first video whether or not it's good but i'm kind of coming around to it is that the land cruiser is a more traditionally styled vehicle it's very square. There's not a lot of risks taken. I think it looks great, but it's not, you know, pushing the edge of future futurism. Whereas the Forerunner is very blocky. It's got all sorts of crazy angles and swoops and, and swishes and c- cool colors and bronze wheels and like it really stands out there. So it's going to come down to at that price point. Yes, some of the off-road stuff, which you talked about, but also whether or not you just like the look and the name and the design of the Land Cruiser over the Forerunner. Yeah, you know, so uh, to me, the new um, Land Cruiser kind of uh, harkens back to the 80 series that we own. Uh, in that, you know, the 80 series was um, more of a more of a mall crawler in some ways than an off roader. The 80 series. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how it was used. I know you're looking at me and you're saying you can get that thing triple locked, and people. You know, lifted it, but from from you know, you spent your childhood driving around from our neighborhood to school in an eighty series, and I think that's how most people use it. I'm not saying yeah, oh for I, sure. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't designed by Toyota to go hard off roading because you could, like I said, triple lock it. But most of the majority of those weren't triple locked, and and they end up being the suburban. But uh, that's the same with the hundred series and the two hundred series. Yeah, yeah, and and honestly, the sixty series is as well. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not sure it's a return to the eighty series in, in that way. Because the hundreds were used well, just like that as well. What I miss about the current uh, Land Cruiser, and to me, it's the most iconic part of it, are those fold down seats in the back. Yeah, you want the third row. Yeah, I just you know because they were they were mounted to the side, and I'm not sure people used them a lot because it's kind of a silly way to you know it's hard to get in and out. It's it also takes of, up a lot of trunk space. space. But it, it became like so iconic that the Land Cruiser kind of represented. It represented what a Land Cruiser was, right? And I kind of missed that in the new one. And ironically, if you look at the new one, they actually have cup holders back there, and but no seat. Well, as I understand <laughs> it, the reason for that is certain markets abroad are getting a third row. Yeah. So certain versions. And Toyota will say, well, the cup holders in the trunk are great for camping. And, and you know, you're out 
camping in the back of your car, you want to put your beverages someplace. So you That's can what they that. said. You're exactly yeah. right. Also, yeah. the Trail Hunter, speaking of which, has a compressor in the back. Which is cool, yeah. Which so is also nice. I do agree with you. I think you get more. Uh, say the Trail Hunter is 63, which I think is a good bet. Yeah. Uh, Plus markup. You're going to get more gadgets with the Trail Hunter compared to the Land Cruiser. That's that's almost for sure. But the Land Cruiser offers that third transfer, that third differential in the in the transfer case, and it offers, um, you know, some other some other stuff that kind of counteracts some of the the features. I guess I'm saying is, what's your use case, right? If if you wanna go and, you know, occasionally off road and go on the dirt roads, you know, in your neighborhood or in the Great American West, uh, but not necessarily go do like frame bender and metal masher and Poison Spider and Hell's Revenge in Moab, then go with the Land Cruiser. Because if you do want to do that, you're going to have to, I'm serious, you're going to have to build it out. It's just from the factory. It'll do it, but you'll you'll break stuff. Yeah. Even, even with the bash plates. You're probably going to want some sliders on there for sure, and you're going to want some some more aggressive can, rubber and maybe a little threes. lift. Yeah. But 30, I mean, I think a stock Land Cruiser is going to amaze you work and go. No, I'm not. You know, you're yeah, gonna but, be but it, a it bottomed out pretty quickly when I took it off road. Sure. Yeah, it's only got 8.6 inches or something is what they claim. Now, so, here's the pickle. So, so if you want to go do Hell's Revenge, get yourself the new Trail Hunter. The, wait, wait yeah, for but it. the Land Cruiser will do Hell's Revenge. Yeah. A guy in a Crown Vic did Hell's Revenge, Dad. I think the Land Cruiser will do Hell's Revenge. Yeah. Okay, so I, I went like this if you're watching this. Not because I didn't think it would do it, but because I hate bashing on things. I hate breaking things. I hate being hard on things. And, yes, you, you can do it. But you'll bash on it. Yeah, but it's a Land Cruiser. That's what it's designed to do. It's got skid plates. If you're paying for the skid plate, Dad, you better be using the skid plate. That's my mentality. Well, look, we just had the Ineos Grenadier. That also had 31s. Yeah, and it was fine. But it had two more inches of ground clearance. So this is the other vehicle that I think also throws a big question into the equation, and that is for a few thousand dollars more, you can spec yourself a GX 550 Overtrail. So we're looking at 69 for this vehicle. Um, and now this is an interesting, this is an interesting choice. So 69, that's after destination, 67 beforehand. And this vehicle offers the same capabilities as the Land Cruiser, but with a nicer interior and a V6 instead of a four cylinder. So this might be the one for people, and I'm doing air quotes now, in the know. And the reason I say that is, I don't want to mention who this was, but on the program, I talked to somebody who's very deep into the Toyota world. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if they've announced it yet, so I don't want to be like, like you know, taking any uh, uh, splash away from their announcement. Uh, but I asked them, you know, which of these three are you buying? And without hesitation, they said GX. Yeah, I mean, and I, I want to say three, four one or Land Cruiser or GX. And GX is a max, depending on how it's configured, of nine thousand pounds of towing, so you get more towing. You still get the locking diff. You get the aggressive tires and um, the better approach angle compared to the standard GX. So this offers a lot of value. Plus, you get a much nicer interior. So I, I kind of think that this is this is the way to go. There's two versions of the Overtrail. There's the standard one and then the Overtrail Plus. That one's going to be, you know, we're talking eighty grand. And, and you know, I said at the beginning of this uh, show that you know only Jeep and Land Cruiser, uh, Land Rover. Oh, sorry, I've got land on my brain now. Only Jeep and uh, a Land Rover do hard off-roading uh, for journalists. Uh, apparently, the program we went on with the GX, they set up a really difficult course. But unfortunately, the day we were there, it got rained out. So we got. So so I don't want to like leave the impression that Toyota's not doing hard off-roading. We went on a dirt road with it, and. I talked to some other people who actually got to go on the off-road course, and they said it was very difficult. But then I also thought to myself, you know, I talked to a lot of journalists who go on Subaru programs, and they say they're very difficult. And then I look at the program, and I'm like, that doesn't look difficult. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's just it's kind of a, it's kind of what you're used to. It's a spectrum for sure. Yeah. No, I think the GX is an interesting proposition. I, I think for me, um, I I need to take both of them off-road and compare. I personally like the look of the Land Cruiser a little more than the GX, but people love this new GX, and I think rightfully so. It's a really attractive vehicle. Not saying it isn't, but I also like the hybrid system. Four-cylinder maybe get a little bit more efficiency, and I don't need to tow. So the Land Cruiser for me, I think, is a better option. But if you're already in that sixty to sixty-five thousand dollar territory, it's not a stretch to think that those folks may be able to afford sixty-seven, sixty-nine thousand. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to come across as sounding, you know, we're only comparing these based on how good they are off road because that's kind of where this conversation is going. But the truth of the matter is, all three are great on road. 
right? And I keep thinking to myself, they're all very comfortable. The, the new, uh, well, we haven't driven the 4Runner, so I can't tell if it's, I'm just assuming it's going to be good off on road because it's basically based on Tacoma, which we own. Mm-hmm. So if it drives like the Tacoma, it's just going to be really good on road, very comfortable, much more torque down, much lower in the rev band, uh, very, uh, I would say, rev happy, uh, four cylinder, the only downside of that engine. And the, uh, I think, eight speed transmission is it doesn't sound great, but that's pretty much any four cylinder uh, turbo nowadays. But, um, but why wouldn't you want that off road ability? When you can get it. So the other vehicle that you could also put in this class potentially is, of course, the Land Rover Defender 110. Also starts at right around 61, 62 after destination. Which we've also owned. For a base model. Yeah. And, you know, this is also a very interesting proposition. I I really do like the Defender. Realistically, you're not going to get into one for under 70. So this is going to be on the on the top end of the comparison. You, you have to give it to Jerry McGovern, who designed it. I'm looking at it right now on the screen. Yeah, and it's very I, good. And, and, you know, you, you can tell the Toyota with, especially with the round lights on the Land Cruiser, crib some of the design elements from the uh, Defender. I like the interior actually a lot more on the Defender compared very, to both. Very utilitarian. Yeah, but it's also got kind of like an air of luxury. So, like, you've got the exposed bolt heads, but then you've got really nice leather on the steering wheel, and you can get it on the seats, and it... It, it feels really good, and I think you can still get it with rubber floors, which is cool. So I think the Defender interior is cooler than all of them. I think that the exterior design is okay. And then, of course, the thing you have to mention, because we have to, unfortunately, is longevity. Look, we had some bad luck with <laughs> one or two of ours. But from folks I've talked to, overall, they have been pretty good. Long term, actually, folks seem to be really happy with them. And there's a lot of options you can get on Defender. You can get the off-road package with the locking rear diff. You can get it with a towing package. You can get it with air suspension, which you can't get on the other vehicles. So there is some advantage to going with the Land Rover. Plus, it's got, you know, and I, I we talked about how it's bad, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people do like that brand and that image, right? Yeah, and Defender does offer that, that brand and that image. Yeah, uh, Defender, uh, you know, is I love the look of it. I, uh, you know, love the ride. I love the handling. Uh, I love the smell of it, actually. It's got a really good smell <laughs> to it. Uh, the, the biggest issue it has, I think there are two issues. One, and this it can't help this unless they refresh it. It's no longer the new kid on the block. Sure. So when it, cool. when it first came out, it was like, holy cow, man. You know, they, they just designed something completely different from the old Defender. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people are getting kind of a little bored with it. To some extent, you know, if you wanted one, you would have had one by now. Um, the other problem with it is um, really the operating system that 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 Land Rover has is really slow, cumbersome, and just not intuitive. And that that is something that not just Land Rover suffers with, but every automaker seems to be struggling with that right now. And we know that Apple, for instance, is going to be pop, not just you know Apple CarPlay, but the actual software that runs underneath is going to be now with certain brands built by Apple, and I think that's a good thing because I, I, somehow it seems to me that automakers are really great at building cars but really bad at building operating systems for uh, their screens. And, and let's face it, today the cars and trucks are all about you know how they interface with your life, in other words, how they interface with your phone. And if, you, if it struggles, then, then it becomes kind of cumbersome and you know kind of off-putting to some extent. And the other option too, which we should talk about, is the Grand Cherokee. So also in this same class. Uh, Now, Grand Cherokee does offer some things that Land Cruiser doesn't offer, like you can get it with the plug-in hybrid 4xe version. And, you know, on the lower end, it's certainly if you get the gas model, you can get it in the high 30s. On the upper end, it's going to be, you know, 60, 70. So you're right in line with it. But how do you think like a 4xe Trailhawk Grand Cherokee compares to the the new Land Cruiser? Oh, wow. That's a great question. (sighs) So um, I've got two answers for that, uh, and, and this is, once again, me. Uh, so the Grand Cherokee, along with the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, have kind of moved up market. Mm-hmm. So I, I think they kind of set their sights more on uh, Range Rover and Land Rover versus what they were traditionally, which would be kind of you know more affordable. And so to me, not in terms of off-roadiness, but in terms of luxury, you get a lot more luxury with the Grand Cherokee. It's got a lot more screens. It's got a lot more like bells and whistles you can get. Uh, it's just a much more um, luxurious and in some ways uh, 
um, more, um, more uh, what's, what's another word for luxurious? Premium. More premium car, yeah. Uh, um, whereas the Land Cruiser um, is much more uh, basic in a lot of its design elements and much more utilitarian. So to me, the, the Land Cruiser uh, doesn't necessarily compete with the Jeep Grand Cherokee. It seems like the Jeep Grand Cherokee competes more with the GX these days than it does with the, with the new Land Cruiser. Well, but you're also forgetting, like, the Grand Cherokee spans such a wide... It does, yeah. We had one for a while. We had, we had the off-road Trailhawk. I mean, keep in mind, Grand Cherokee, you've got both two and three row in the standard and the L. You know, base model, if you get a standard two-wheel drive... Laredo, you're going to be looking at like 37, 38. So here's my question. Can you actually get a standard two-wheel drive Laredo? I, I mean, I don't know why you would. You and I'm saying can you. I don't know if you actually can. Once again, when I go by the Jeep dealership and I've gone by a bunch, it's all 4 by es Yeah, no, that's and true. And that, that includes Grand Cherokees. And what does a 4 by start at? They're like 60. Yeah. But keep in mind, 60, there is some tax advantage, you know, tax credit sure. with going with the 4 by e and then if you're looking at like a Trailhawk 4xE, you know, starting at 60s before the credit, you're right in line with that, with that Land Cruiser and pricing. Now, I think the 4xE, that electric only capability for that 20, 25 miles is very cool. I think that's really, really neat. I do agree with you. I think the interior is much more upscale than the Land Cruiser. I don't love the way that this new generation drives off-road. It's very stiff. Even though we do have a new redesigned air suspension system, it feels very firm and it doesn't feel very um, rugged in some ways. Like it, it feels a little fragile because there's just so much stiffness in, in the frame and it feels like a lot of the jolts are being transmitted into the components instead of being soaked up by the tires and the suspension. Now that, that I, I don't know, I haven't broken one off road so I could be way off base here. But um, it, I think that you're right. The exterior wise, the new Grand Cherokee is awesome. Interior is a little too premium for me, but it is worth noting, you know, that 4 by e model delivers a lot of power and it delivers a tremendous amount of torque as well. So it's a it's a pretty high performance vehicle. It's pretty fast. I mean, yeah. 375 horsepower, so 50 more horsepower than the Land Cruiser. Yeah. 470 um, pound feet of torque. That's, yeah. that's a lot of power. Yeah, I'm learning to like the two liter uh, turbo that G puts in both uh, this vehicle and, of course, uh, the Wrangler. But I don't love it, Tommy. I just don't like it um, as much as I like the Toyota's uh, four-cylinder turbo. Why is that? Uh, it just feels a little clunky. It feels less refined. It feels a little bit less uh, less comfortable with the transmission. Uh, I think Jeep, with their 1.0 version of their four uh, by has created something that's outstanding and groundbreaking. But um, certainly, it's the first go at it. Oh. Uh, and so, so, so there's a lot of different systems that are at play, and sometimes it feels like they're not quite dialed in yet, so that it's a seamless uh, flow of power and torque um, and regenerative uh, braking. Whereas Toyota has been building hybrid systems now forever, right? As long as they are, and, and to me, those feel like they're really dialed in, right? They're, if you didn't know it was a hybrid. Um, you wouldn't guess it was a hybrid. Yeah. Whereas no. you'll know it's a hybrid when you get into the Jeep. You yeah. I, I mean, I think that the four, the, 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 it was originally called the Hurricane engine, actually, and now that name's been kind of applied to the six cylinder, but the two liter four cylinder, um, it's a little coarse. The power band is very abrupt, low, low end, and then there's not a lot in the upper end, and it doesn't interface very well with the hybrid system in low range. So I think there's definitely some tweaking that needs to be done there. So yeah, I mean, for me, if you're looking for an on-road vehicle only, get a standard V6 Grand Cherokee. It's great. It's really good. If you can get one for under 50, I think it's a great vehicle. If you're looking for a vehicle that's a little bit more rugged to take off-road, I would definitely lean more toward the Land Cruiser. And I haven't driven it, but just from a durability standpoint, I think that feels a little bit better screwed together. Now, if you look at the Ford lineup, so obviously uh, Land Cruiser kind of kind of encompasses a couple different options. You know, it encompasses maybe Explorer. Timberline, right? Because it's kind of closed off SUV, but that's a little bit bigger. And then, of course, you've got Bronco. Um, and Bronco has a really wild pricing model all the way from 39. And then you're getting Raptors now in like the $90,000 yeah. range. So, yeah. plus markup. <laughs> I mean, huge, bandwidth. huge bandwidth. So, so there's no doubt that the Bronco will kill a current Land Cruiser off road. It just uh -huh. will. It just will. Sure. Um, it just will. It's just designed more, much more for off-road use than for on-road use. 
Having said that, the Land Cruiser will be better on road than the Bronco. The Bronco is much better than the Jeep on road uh, because it doesn't have two live axles. Uh, but the Land Cruiser is just much better, um, at least from the little on road, I just on dirt road driving than, than than a Bronco is. The other thing that the Land Cruiser does well is it looks utilitarian without feeling um, cost cutty. And sometimes Ford has this issue, and I'm not using the C word cheap because uh, I think that's unfair, but sometimes you can really tell where the Ford um, accountants got to the car and started saying, nope, 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 nope. Whereas the Land Cruiser also is a little cost cutty in some ways, but it doesn't feel cost cutty if you see what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, I, I understand that. And I think, I think Ford's gotten a lot better at that. I think their interior quality has gone up substantially, but there are certainly some areas in, that we went in our long-term Bronco where we felt like they cheaped out a little bit. And keeping we had one of the first ones, so I'm sure they've gotten better over the years. But I do like the Bronco. I mean, I, I really like its packaging. I really love its capability, especially if you can get one with that front diff lock. Design is incredible. Even with just the rear, yeah, the top, the door integration is better than the Jeep in, in most ways. I mean, it is such a cool vehicle. And they've been out for long enough now, too, right? If you... It, Part of the issue with buying a Land Cruiser or a Foreigner or whatever is that they are brand new and there's a lot of anticipation and you're going to have to, if you're not in line already, you're going to have to get in line, fight with markups, fight with dealers, fight with availability. And that's a very stressful experience. Whereas, you know, the Broncos now, you can just go to any Ford dealer and there's going to have six of them on the lot. You pick one. It's probably not going to be marked up. There might even be some money in the hood. You drive out the door and you got a really cool vehicle that you can take the doors and the top off of. And, so, and I love the Heritage Edition. Yeah, Those are the so, Heritage oh Edition. Oh my God, they're so really good cool. looking. Yeah, the, especially the uh, white roof. Um, you know, they're, the, the 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 blue one there, Tommy. Yeah, that 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 is. I love that. Yeah, Does but it have a white, I thought it had a white roof. Yeah, I have the roof off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there the you go. Now you got the white stripes roof. on. Yeah. yeah, the Heritage Editions are cool, but this one, this is a Heritage Limited Edition. I mean, look at the price on this. We're we're, we're knocking on the door of seventy G's here, seventy two. Holy moly! So that that is some big money. Although you can get the basic one. For, well, it's for it's less. it's up there with the first edition Land Cruiser. Um, so price wise, they're right in line with each other. But I think what you said is hugely important. If you're one of those people who needs to be first. Then you know, get ready to fight for our Land Cruiser because everybody wants one. People are super excited by them, and Toyota has this kind of interesting way of allocating vehicles in that you can't really go and build one online and then you know wait for it to be delivered to your dealer. Uh, Toyota just builds what they think that people want, and then they deliver them to dealers, and the dealers have to kind of swap cars among themselves. Uh, and that's not going to happen with Land Cruisers until there's a lot more of them built. For sure, yeah. No, I, I think you're on the money. I mean, Bronco. Look, you can get a basic Heritage Edition for. 50s, high 40s, yeah. And keep in mind, Bronco, you also have a choice of a manual transmission, which you don't get in the Land Cruiser. You also have the option for that EcoBoost V6. So if you do really need V6 power, you get it in the in the Bronco. And then, I mean, of course, the last key to the, the, uh, the pie here that we need to talk about is the Wrangler. You know, and Wrangler and Land Cruiser have never really competed in recent decades, but now that Land Cruiser is in that mid-50s territory, I th certainly think there's going to be a certain level of cross shopping going on. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and Wrangler, you know, you can get it with 4xE. As you mentioned, most of them you're going to find on the dealers are going to be 4xEs. It's funny, you know, if we had done this podcast like four years ago, uh, I would have said Wrangler people or G people are G people and they're never switch. But then I met a lot of people who fought Broncos, <laughs> yeah. who used to like be diehard G people. And I'm not saying there isn't still a diehard Jeep community. Uh, but, you know, four years ago, I would have said, it's e if, if you want an off-road or it's either a Wrangler or nothing. Mm -hmm. But now, I don't know. I think it's much more fluid. I think people like to mix and match. I think they like to try different flavors. Uh, and the problem the Jeep is having uh, is that the JL is getting all sold. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been out since 2018. It was refreshed in 2024. In my opinion, they didn't do enough to refresh it. They gave it a new grill, bigger screen, power seat. That's cool. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the corporate would tell you they also cut costs, but realistically, the costs of these vehicles in person, in dealers, are going to be crazy high. I mean, this Willys 4xE, you're, you're going to be mid to high 50s for even a basic one. But once again, you get the tax break because it is, you know, yeah, plug-in hybrid, and yeah. you get 20 miles of all-electric range. So, yeah, I mean, I think the way that Jeep really broke away from the crowd, especially Bronco when it came out, is they started diversifying the powertrain. So you had V6, 2-liter, plug-in hybrid, V8, and that was a good strategy. 
and now they're kind of stuck. You know, there's not a whole lot to really elevate it in some ways above the competition until they start maybe and even inevitably cutting the price because it is getting older. And I, I do think that some of its onward capabilities are somewhat well, well, compromised. I think, I think you saw that graph with the Gladiator, right? When it first came out, they were, and they still are, you know, sticker priced at the top end of the midsize pickup truck world. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but now if you go to your local Jeep dealer, you'll see Gladiators in a lot with like, you know, serious money on the hood uh, because people, the, the, the problem is those who wanted it have bought it. And now, you know, the rest of the world is looking at other vehicles that they're starting to crash up. Yeah, that's, that's kind of that's kind of scratching that itch for the the off roader. Uh, so, of all the vehicles we talked about, now that you've mm -hmm. driven the Land Cruiser a little bit, and the GX and the Bronco Easy. and the Wrangler and the Defender and the Ineos, if you want to go crazy expensive, um, which one is your favorite? All right, if I wanted to daily something, mm -hmm. if I wanted to daily something, I would definitely get the Land Cruiser, not the GX, not the GX, because it's, it's you know once again it's it's very expensive and it's a little too. Uh, premium. Um, mm -hmm. So if I want, you know, but if I want to daily something and then actually do serious off roading, I'm not talking. And I'm talking about Toyotas only. Okay. Well, no, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll add those. All I'll, of it. I'll add those into a second. <laughs> okay. let, 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 let me extend this podcast. So we got an hour, Tommy. Uh, so if I want daily and take it off road, I would get the GX. If 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 money were no object, um, but if I were to get any of the new Toyotas, it would be the Forerunner. Uh, I haven't driven it, but I've seen it. I fell in love with it. The Forerunner Trail Hunter. Okay. Okay. Now talk about. Bronco and the Wrangler. Uh, I love Wranglers and I love Broncos, but for me, um, those are kind of off the list because I get bored and I've been there and done that. Okay. So, you know, right now the most exciting thing we own is a 1945 Jeep <laughs> military MB. And that gets me so excited because it's it's a whole new world of Jeep that I have yet to explore. Uh, and I drove it once and I just absolutely fell in love with it. And not, th not that there's anything wrong with Wranglers, but like I say, been there, done that a lot. Um, you know, certainly one of the most capable off-roaders. Um, same thing with the Defender, kind of been there, done that. And so I'm ready to move on to something new. Um, and, you know, I can't say which one I would buy if I could only buy one because I haven't driven the 4Runner. We really have an off-road of the GX uh, and we really have an off-road of the Land Cruiser. So th this, I've kind of given you kind of a, you know, a, a basic best I can description of what I would buy. Yeah, and I think you're right. We do need more hands-on time with Land Cruiser and GX, and then, of course, 400. No one is driven. I mean, I think for me, um, I do agree that the... I think if, if you do have the money, the GX is a is a better package than the Land Cruiser. It might be the one for the people in the know. Yeah, but I, I don't think I could justify spending 69 on a on a new vehicle that I was going to take off-road. I think that the um, 400 looks very cool, but I'm not a big fan of the styling. Fair. So I think it looks cool in in a very futuristic way, but it's a little busy. So I, I like Land Cruiser more than Forerunner. And then, you know, when you bring in the competition, Defender is cool, but it's just too expensive. Especially, you know, if, if you're going to be in the mid-60s, you're going to be four-cylinder, and I love that four-cylinder Defender. So that's kind of, if I had 80, I'd go Defender. That's off the list, though, for because just pricing. Well, if I had 200, I'd go G-Wagon. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> same thing with the Ineos. It's just too expensive. Yeah. Um, I think that the Wrangler is a little old, and it's just too compromised on road now for most folks as a daily driver. I mean, it, it, it just needs to be better in, in a lot of ways, it's, yeah, it's especially problem, for the price point. The, the problem it's just I have not. with the Wrangler is uh, I just can't move the seat far, far enough back. I just drove the Gladiator, same problem, all the way from Moab here. And I just always, every time I got another thing, I would reach for the, now that it's electric control, and I was always trying to scoot it back another inch. And that's a that's a me problem because I've got a weird torso, short body, long legs. But, yeah, I just need a little bit more room. So then that, I mean, that leaves the Bronco. And I, I, I kind of still think that the Bronco offers the best compromise between crazy off-road capability but still pretty good on-road, but you can still take the top off. And you can get a manual transmission, and you can get a front locker. And, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I really do like that Bronco. I mean, I, I think it's going to be between me. It's going to be between Bronco and Land Cruiser. I'd like to get them side by side. I haven't driven the Land Cruiser. Maybe it's phenomenal. So I'm really excited to spend some time in that. But um, just initial impressions, I'm still leaning more toward the Ford over the Toyota because of the top-off capability and because you can get one fairly well equipped for under 50. Yeah, you fell in love with that Everglades, didn't you, when you went yeah, on the program? Yeah, I did like that Everglades. Yeah. That was really that one, cool. That was some good off-roading. the factory winch. We did some good off-roading in that trip. Yeah, it's also amazing that, like, uh, right now, uh, and I know we're just at the beginning of the Land Cruiser rollout, but there aren't a lot of the serious off-road uh, uh, add-ons that, that I would want 
You know what I'm saying? Well, no one has them. What? No one has them. Here, a Bronco has them. You can get a Bronco with a factory winch. You oh, can... you mean like Toyota itself? Yeah. yeah. Optioning. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, they're leaving once again. They're doing the same thing that the other manufacturers did, and they're leaving a lot of room. You know. A lot of money on the table for aftermarket, and mm. I'm just I'm just curious about why don't do that, Toyota. There's so much more you could do to the Land Cruiser, and I'm just not talking about bumpers, but you know, give it some, give it some like better off-road worthy tires from, well, from the factory. So the first edition does come with a lot of that stuff. Like, some of that. It's stuff. got the rock rails and the roof rack. It's got um, more overlandy stuff. Yeah, it's got the mud guards, right? So it's got some uh, stuff. Mud guards, Tommy. Well, you, can get, I, you can get a Jeep now with 35s from the factory with the Extreme I know, Recon I know, package. I know, I know, I know. It'd be really cool, like, if they did a factory winch. I think that would be awesome. If they did TRD skid plates, if they did a two-inch lift, like, that all should be and, and, factory option. And, like, you know, here's a great op opportunity. I incorporate Onyx, you know, one of our partners, which is great off-road, which shows you Jeep does that with a different provider. But I'm saying I would, if I were Toyota, I'd be reaching out to Onyx and saying, hey, can I have the software built into the vehicle so that I can, you know, go and explore places that are much more off-road than on-road? Yeah. No, I think it's just really basic, smart. Just st basic yeah. stuff like that, you know? I mean, the one I probably wouldn't get, that first edition, I think, is a big premium over Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser. And it doesn't get you that much more. I think that's – Toyota's capitalizing on the fact that people want to have it first, which is ultimately a smart business move. And people are going to pay. Yeah, you know, like we did with the Cybertruck – by getting the foundation yeah. series and then not getting it. Yeah, that first. went great. Yeah, that, really that well. worked that worked brilliantly. And you know, Gladiator did the same thing too. A lot of people, people got really pissed off because the first edition gladiators yeah, eventually were first. delivered after the base ones. Yeah, that, yeah. That's that, that's not a good look if you're an automaker. But it looks like Toyota is doing the first editions first. Yes, so that is are. a good move. Don't get me wrong. That's a smart move. It, it would seem a logical move. It would seem a logical, <laughs> logical move. move, yes. But I think I would, if I if it was my money, I would wait for the fifty eight. Or the Land Cruiser spec. I mean, let the let the people get their first editions first and, and have fun with them and be jealous for a few months. But then I'll save, like, in some cases, ten thousand dollars to get the the Land Cruiser so, spec. So there's another problem with the Land Cruiser, which we haven't discussed, and we can close on this, okay? Okay. Uh, color choices. So I love the 1958. But uh, the, the three bad colors, black, three, white, and gray. Yeah, I know. A refrigerator, I hate black, and I hate gray. Like, could you get less interesting colors? I mean, it's almost like they did it on purpose to make you. Well, I think they probably did. Yeah, but that, I hate that too. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't decontent the base one to make you, or at least if you're going to decontent it, don't decolor it to make you jump up to the next one up. And even if you go to the next one, right, the Land Cruiser, there's that blue one, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the colors are also so. I mean, they're so boring. They're very muted. Yeah, you you really almost have to go to the first edition to get anything that's at all like unique yeah, and interesting. Yeah, but the, no, the first edition is the same colors. Oh, it's got that gold or sandy or you whatever. You get browns. that on the Land Cruiser too. Can you? I I think you're they're they're betting that folks buying the Land Cruiser are going to be a little bit more grown up and mature. Where, where is the forest green? Where well, is the, the Forerunner is going to have those? Where is the red? I think Forerunner is going to have all the fun colors. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's not no no get, don't don't give people choice <laughs> please give pe people love having choice okay yeah all right folks well we'd love to hear what you think about the upcoming four-wheel drive wars toyota had such a big few months with this and they're really cranking out some cool stuff we just need to get them out to colorado out to utah you, you want to do a little bit of a rant no i think you should you've been really upset about that uh lexus that we have now this week so we have a we have a Lexus RX 450 H plus. Yes. Yes, and it just it just beeps constantly at us. It does beep a lot. It, it mean it. And we had the same problem with the Tacoma. It's like Toyota's getting a little too nannyish with their products. So like for example, so it it it, it snowed today. So it beeps at the parking sensors are blocked. Okay. And then you turn it off. Hang on. Okay. Beeps at the parking sensors are blocked. So you, so you start driving, it stops beeping, and then it gives you a warning on the dash. It says parking sensors are blocked. And then you're like, clear it. All right, I know they're blocked. Drive for another couple minutes. Parking sensors are blocked. Clear it. Drive for a couple minutes. Parking sensors are blocked. So you have to go on into the screen and turn out the parking sensor. So that was great. Figure that out. Drove along another five, 10 minutes to get a warning. Oh, your adaptive cruise is blocked. Oh, okay, clear that. Adaptive cruise is blocked. Your radar sensors. And I'm like, then then you got to, then I turned off like the driving assist and it still got the warning. So. They just need to be a little bit less naggy with some of their warnings. Yeah, how about your attention 
warning. Yep, that I did figure out you can just go into the screen and disable and thank God because every time you look out the window, it says driver inattention. That's not it, just her. That, that, that's a lot of, yeah. Yeah, that was really, really bad. Um, but yeah, it's just a little fussy. And then the electronic door handles, no one over the age of 60 can figure out. <laughs> So there's a that, button you push. That includes me, Tom. And you have to push the button in the door at the same time. But if you push the button in the wrong direction, then it tries to do the manual version. And then and then the old people get really confused. I, I got the point. I got so confused that I'm not using the manual door <laughs> method. Well, it's just a mess. To pull it out the, twice to override it, the electronic door. If you're not in park, then yeah, it doesn't want to unlock. And it's just a lot of... A lot of fuss with it. So I think that's bad. The powertrain's great. I really like the plug-in hybrid system. It's a very comfortable car. The seats are good. Um, design it, is not good. The design is not they've good. Gone, they've no, gone, they've gone full good. like like beluga whale. Yeah, it is not good. <laughs> no. But the car is very comfortable. It's a little too expensive. This one's like mid-70s. I, I, I see clouds on the horizon because the RX is Lexus's most... Uh, Popular car. It's the one by far. It sells more than any. I, I think it sells more than all the other models combined. And they they, they didn't they didn't nail it, Tommy. They just didn't nail it in this generation. And that's a problem for Lexus. Well, yeah, but they have so many other great cars. I mean, once again, it's, it's the most. The, yeah, it's the one I you got to get right. But the, their this crossover is, lineup now. I mean, not all. It used to be they only had the the RX and like the GX and now LX and. NX and the, yeah, but it's the still UX. A, it's still the sweet spot in the yeah, in, so, the, in, 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 in kind of the size and then money-wise. Just wise. a little fussy. But yeah. a good car, it's just fussy. I, I, see, I, I see a uh, mid-cycle refresh coming sooner than later on the RX. <laughs> well, I hope they, they fix the, the front end because it's very uh, angular. All right, well, that was our rant. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, leave a comment. We do read our comments. And, of course, if you want to see the video of me and Andre comparing the two Land Cruisers, go to alltfl.com. We really appreciate you guys listening uh, because without you, uh, we couldn't do this. Uh, and we shall see you next time. Yep. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.